Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion. Um, yeah, delighted to, to, to be the moderator of this panel today. Um, Professor Juramek doesn't need to be introduced any, anymore, I think that's fine. Um, I would like to, to ask the other panelists to briefly introduce themselves before we get getting right into the discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Heike Winter. I'm from the Deutsche Bundesbank, the German Central Bank. Um, I'm uh, in the payments uh, division and uh, in this respect not a supervisor but uh, see the whole development of uh, crypto tokens uh, up to ICOs uh, from uh, the perspective of a central bank from the payments uh, angle. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Hagen Weiss and I'm a federal counsel with the BaFin, the German federal securities regulator. And what I do on a daily basis is I actually look at ICOs and determine whether they are securities or not, in short. That's perfect. Um, now that we already have the view of one of the world leading scholars in the field, um, the question to you guys, um, what is from your perspective blockchain and ICOs, also from payment but also from a fundraising perspective, is it, is it uh, an innovation we need to keep in mind? How big you see this at scale for the next 6 to 12 months? What are your major concerns with that kind of new phenomenon from your both perspectives? Would you like to start? Uh, may I, um, perhaps, uh, yes, the whole uh, topic uh, crypto tokens is from the technical perspective, of course, a new and an in innovation. But uh, when you think uh, in this more theoretical way, then you can say we, it's a, it's a pr as a, speaking about crypto tokens uh, for payments, then the most prominent example is still uh, Bitcoin. And you can compare this, uh, as you like, to a regional, we, because we had also private currencies on a regional level. This is something uh, which is not new and existed for ages, more or less. But uh, now, it's uh, with this new technical background, it's uh, yes, really something new because it's on a lo global level, and that makes it so yes, interesting. And I guess, Mr. Weiss, more from a securities laws perspective, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I concur. It's a major thing. It's a major innovation. And at the same time, it raises a lot of difficult legal issues, a lot of issues which we haven't seen. So, and you know, basically answering your question, it, it's going to be a major thing b with all its possible and potential repercussions and ramifications, even on like a, you know, society as a whole. And could you, you might share us some background on your uh, current practice when it comes to dealing with ICOs from a German securities regulator's perspective in terms of enforcement? How do processes and coordination with startups going to lo look like? Definitely. Well, uh, our current regulatory standpoint is Waffin uses a case-by-case -case analysis, meaning we look at each case individually and we determine more or less like three things. A, are those tokens or maybe even coins transferable? Are they negotiable on the capital markets? And most importantly, are there any rights attached to the individual token, which is what Professor Rimmer has already outlined? Um, cash flow, dividends, profit rights, governance rights, that kind of stuff. So you basically, as far as the legal reasoning is concerned, you have to keep three things in mind, transferable, negotiable, and rights attached. That's our case by case approach. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think this, this is particularly interesting because most people are still trying to, to, to find a way or to, to get a better sense of uh, what, what does a utility token look like from a Baffin perspective as opposed to a security token and how to, to draw this uh, thin line uh, most, most startups in the market are trying to avoid securities laws. Totally with you on that one. Well, there's, there's, you know, what there, there's uh, basically two factions right now. There, there's the ones who try to like avoid being labeled as securities, which is, you know, for obviously and apparent reasons. And on the other hand, there, there's another group who, you know, deliberately tries uh, to be deemed securities. So, and um, as far as finding out what Bafin thinks about that, there's a there's a publication readily available on the, um, the Bafin homepage, also in English. So. You know, that basically answers a lot of questions. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And also there's, there's a second perspective or a second layer of, of interesting regulatory questions when it comes to, to qualifying tokens. Um, this German specific concept of a unit of account, uh, which leads uh, to a situation at least across Europe where we have a, um, a special way of qualifying tokens because nearly all, almost all tokens somehow qualify as a unit as account and therefore as such as a, as a financial instrument under German banking laws, which um, makes it uh, rather unattractive from a, from a commercial perspective to set up shop in, in, in Germany and running your ICO or token fund funding out of Germany. And this Could you give, the, give us a little bit, bit of background on that one as well? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, well, I think there, there, there's a few things that you should keep in mind here. It pretty much depends on your business uh, model on, and your business idea that you have. You know, the the units that you like mentioned aren't necessarily going to be a problem if you get your securities laws right. And like you mentioned, Germany as uh, you know as an example. The thing is, I want to say like 90% of all financial securities laws have their origin you know, on an EU level, on a European level. So it's not necessarily Germany, you know, th those damn Germans, you know, making it so goddamn hard <laughs> on I'm those stories. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm German myself, so don't, <laughs> don't take offense. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, the interesting concept is that um, uh, the majority of, uh, for instance, crypto brokerage uh, firms and other firms like providing crypto or token related services, investment services are trying to run those businesses out of, well, let's say Austria, Switzerland, um, even Belgium, France, just, just for the reason that um, utility tokens at, in this jurisdiction do not qualify as a financial instrument under their respective banking laws. This is something which, which, which is quite interesting because um, and it, in, at least to my personal experience, this leads actually to the situation that we have. Um, we, we do see highly talented development teams based out of Berlin, but running their token offerings out of Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Gibraltar, more, more Malta. Like hmm. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I've seen that too. And believe me, um, what I do is I closely examine what's going on with other jurisdictions too. And um, while the Swiss have been you know, quite opportunistic as far as that is concerned. The, the Crypto Valley, I mean, what they did is they, you know, started a huge marketing machine that, you know, highlighted the advantages, the advantages of being like a, a Swiss ICO. If you really compare the legal framework, as far as securities are concerned, you know, the German background gives you a lot of accuracy, it gives you a lot of like dependability, and it gives you a lot of, of other advantages, which I'll be you know happy to highlight later on, maybe during dinner or something. So Yeah, I totally agree. And this is something I slightly disagree with you, because most most startups we've advised on, we've seen in the last six or twelve months actually embrace regulation for the, for exactly that reason, to 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 have a prospective or a proper license in place which a sort of passport across Europe or in other jurisdictions and, and definitely consider this as a type of USP as opposed, well, and in simple words, we no, no longer have 2016 or 2017, which is in blockchain terms like 20 years ago right now. Um, <laughs> at least it feels like that. But talking about Switzerland, is the interesting thing is, um, this also goes to the regulators again, is um, the way Swiss Finma is a is, is embracing the technology and the entire phenomenon. It's, it's not only a marketing machine running out of Crypto Valley, um, it's uh, the Swiss Finma, the, the Swiss National Bank, all those stakeholders are on board in a way that they're trying to enable um, newly designed and decentralized uh, business models and with a clear intention to attract more blockchain startups coming to Switzerland, that's for sure. Um, do you see, from a regulator's perspective, any severe shortcomings when looking at, let's say, uh, legislative initiatives uh, in Liechtenstein, you already mentioned Gibraltar as well, or even Switzerland? Is there something which, well, Professor Jörmik just, just mentioned uh, coined the term, we have a, uh, a competition between jurisdictions in, the, in, this, sort, in this sense. Um, yes, it's a general remark. It's uh, because this uh, kind of competition is now uh, so more severe because uh, 
they are so flexible, those people who are uh, coming up with ICOs. And uh, so we mentioned that also somewhere uh, during the morning sessions we had that, uh, yes, how to uh, locate them really, what is the uh, criterion to say, where is the, the, the ICO um, situated? Is it, uh, is it the personal address of the issuer or what is it? And so uh, this is something that makes it, uh, I think, more difficult than we had it in uh, former years. And also, uh, yes, the, the, the strong competition, which is now uh, challenging uh, regulators in a way, you can say. But do you see any, any, any lack of investors' protection in these jurisdictions or...? Well, I can definitely see where you're coming from and thank you for that question. But I'm not going to, you know, it, it's a nice bait, but I'm not going to comment on that because I'm not going to criticize the, the, the Swiss colleagues or the, no, no, the no, Lipton no, no, Shine no. <laughs> colleagues <laughs> because at the, at, at the end of the day, you know, we're all government lawyers. Yeah. We're trying to protect the public. No, there might be just different approaches to, to address this, the similar problems, oh, right? Most, most definitely. So the, the thing is... Um, you know, our, our mandate, BaFin and pretty much any other securities regulator um, around the world, has its mandate to protect the public, to protect investors. So basically, it's all about upholding the law, okay? And not about particular business interests, which I totally get because I've worked in private practice too as a lawyer, so you have to advise your clients. But at the same time, I'll let you in on a little secret. When I get up in the morning, I don't plan like which little startup am I gonna am I gonna strangle next <laughs> so so I you know I'm glad to hear that <laughs> you're welcome definitely if, if a plan if a business venture succeeds even better but our mandate is to protect the public now in the US the regulator has two missions one is investor protection the other is capital formation and these are not necessarily either or that you have to do one or the other. You know, there really should be a sweet spot where you're optimizing the balance between both. But what I think the message of my talk was intended to be is that they're doing almost an exclusive focus on investor protection and ignoring the other part of their mission. And in the end, if there's no capital formation, there's no economic growth, no new jobs. You know, it's very, very expensive in the long run. We've had... Um, a federal system in the U.S. that has permitted the 50 states to compete in many areas of corporate regulation. And this goes back to areas like mergers and acquisitions in the 1980s and even bankruptcy codes back in the 19th century. And the debate that has always taken place is whether this is the race to the top or the race to the bottom. And you know, do they make more and more lenient laws to attract shady promoters? I think you can control this within the 50 states because ultimately Congress can step in, but internationally this is much harder because you do have groups like the Bank for International Settlements that have some type of loose oversight but very little enforcement. And the incentives for one or two companies to break off or one or two countries to break out of that framework and do whatever they want are you know, really much higher within the international community. And I think the, um, the inability for any international organization to really enforce a common set of rules and values make it very likely that the, the water will seek the lowest level. And um, whether that is going to be Switzerland or the United Arab Emirates or Estonia, you know, th there are many people that are kind of nibbling around the edges of this game. And you know, I think we're only in the early stages of what might be a very interesting period where countries keep innovating and experimenting often with very different objectives. And may, uh, may I have also one word? It's, uh, because we have in, in Germany the, the mandate of the BaFin is very clear of the banking supervision, but uh, it's, uh, you can also, and I think you, you know that from discussions you have in Berlin, that there is also, um, the, the, the BaFin is strict and say we have this, the clear mandate and we will, uh, keep to that, but on the other hand, you have also a lot of political discu discussions now um, about industry policy, because that is the thing um, which is in the mind of a lot of politicians to say, let's keep this innovative uh, or might be innovative firms in, in, in the country. And, uh, but the mandate of the BaFin is uh, the same as it is. So, Interestingly, in Switzerland, uh, Swiss FINMA has also, also a political mandate similar to the SEC in the US. 
which might lead to, to different approaches in regulating um, uh, such a nascent commercial phenomenon in a way. So this yeah. is... The irony is that when Trump appointed Jay Clayton, it was in the belief that he was a capital formation guy who was going to stop all the excessive regulation that you had under Obama. And it's been completely the opposite. He has been the most aggressive regulator in the SEC since the 1930s. And doesn't seem to care a damn about capital formation. It, I mean, it's just exactly the opposite of what people thought they were getting. But you know, balancing this, if anything, the SEC has been criticized for going too much in the other direction, you know, for ignoring problems like Bernie Madoff and all the credit default swaps that led to the financial crisis. You know, that all of this happened without the SEC really putting a stop to it. And now you're seeing a real swing in the other direction, very surprisingly, under a government that's supposed to be pro-business free market is turning out to be a very heavy-handed regulator discovering consumer protection at a time where the rest of the government couldn't care less about it. Yeah, and there are two further aspects. The, the, the first one is that uh, regulation is just one one aspect taken to, to be in count when designing a tokens, uh, token offering or deciding over the jurisdiction where you would like to offer your, your, your token because um, to, to my experience, the most important aspect is whether or not you have a viable ecosystem uh, which you can make use of, whether you have banks which are actually willing uh, and, and able to take monies uh, raised via an ICO, for instance. And the, another interesting aspect is that what we've seen quite lately is that a lot of um, crypto intermediary is like, well, let's, let's for instance, take Coinbase, um, are seeking governmental uh, approval in many jurisdictions, trying to, to, to get to sort of an ev evolutionary step to a regulated infrastructure to get to crypto infrastructure 2.0, which uh, may or may not will enable a wide, wide range of institutional investors to, to, to enter the market while complying with their internal um, compliance requirements at the same time. Um, is it, is it, Professor Jormek, from your perspective, fair to say that, that 2018 is, is already uh, the year of the rise of the security token? Or um It's certainly in the last three to six months one of the most interesting things. The, um, the stable coins, as they're called, tether and basis that are meant to mimic the U.S. dollar, and the increasing attempts to securitize everything from credit card receivables to real estate ownership and precious metals. We've seen this going back into the 80s and 90s on Wall Street where people brought things like collateralized mortgage obligations to the market. But what this does is dice them into much smaller pieces with probably much higher liquidity so that ordinary investors can trade them in very small volumes. I think this is actually a very promising, you know, even an overdue innovation that will make asset classes that most households couldn't have invested in. It'll make them affordable and accessible to a much broader market. It would lower the cost of finance in those different industries. Um, it's also squarely within the securities laws as currently written. So I don't see these things as nearly as controversial or even as interesting. I think they're a very healthy application of the technology. I would also say that some of these stable coins that are pegged to currencies I'm skeptical that they'll work. You know, it looks a lot like Argentina trying to run a currency board, and this works until you run out of money. And most people run out of money. Even the Swiss backed off of pegging the Swiss franc to the euro and so forth. So I, I'm not sure I would own these things myself, but they clearly are responding to market demand and, and trying to meet a need that investors at a small retail level have had for a long time. Yeah, and this also comes with a with a huge opportunity to to implement some sort of smart contract based automated compliance directly into the trading protocol, which uh, just just take for instance, assume you you would like to ensure that a certain security is just just traded among accredited investors in the U.S. and you could you could make sure that by by trusting the protocol that. Yeah. Buyer and seller are definitely accredited investors. No, I mentioned before that this technology solves many problems. Exactly. And, and this would be very high on the list, that it really can be quite helpful with compliance if you're inclined to stay at the high end of the market, and I think many people are. 
And it makes the regulator's job much easier. It even arguably makes the regulator unnecessary, which is something that they're probably worried about, but for a, a rather different reason. I think we're all keen to hear your, your response to that one. <laughs> if, if I'm worried about job security or job safety, <laughs> no, I'm not. But it's definitely, it, it's definitely um, yeah, uh, a good point. But yeah, definitely. Uh, I think everybody who, who you know, listens to the market has seen some kind of, you know, almost like an uprising of security tokens this year. So, indeed. What? Do you, have you already seen some, some security token offerings um, approved by your agency so far? Well, there, there's this like, you know, little thing called confidentiality, unfortunately. But definitely, like, you know, speaking from a market perspective, and, and I, I've said that um, a few minutes ago, there is, there's different groups, and there are definitely people who try to you know, be deemed as securities, and who talk to us too. I mean, there, there's always a lot of people talking to the regulator, so. Another interesting aspect when it comes to, to distributed ledger technology and, and well, the, the intersection to conventional traditional capital markets is how could, could DLT influence um, current payment systems we have? And I guess there, there was a, uh, an experiment running between German Central Bank and the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, right? Could you just share some background on that one. What was the, the, the major goal of this experiment? Do we have any, do you have any outcomes you actually use in practice? So this was really, um, yes, uh, in general, if you come to a distributed letter technology or blockchain technology, um, for the, uh, yes, at, at the moment, we don't see a need to, uh, to change payment systems because they work very smoothly, very efficiently. And so we see not, uh, and we have central issuer of the uh, of, <laughs> of the money. So uh, so we don't see at the moment uh, any need to that. Uh, what what um, banks or other financial uh, actors always um, stress when when it comes to blockchain technologies, then they say they need something. Uh, they need money on the blockchain. And uh, this is because otherwise it makes things more complicated if, when they have to change every day. Um, uh, they have to invent a, um, yes, a simulation of money and then they have to change it afterwards to settle things. And this is uh, something that we get quite often uh, from, from many banks, especially the demand. Uh, could we invent something like uh, we would call that a wholesale? Uh, digital money. This is one aspect. And uh, for the for this experiment with the Deutsche Börse, there was the idea uh, try to simulate uh, such an environment where we have uh, on the one hand a bon bond issuing authority, on, on the other hand a coin issuing authority, to uh, make some uh, ex ex yeah, experiences uh, to use the blockchain because that was more. A technical experiment. There was not the uh, the idea behind that we will switch everything uh, on on the blockchain. It was more to experiment with DLT as a settlement technology then. Or? Yes, okay. yes, yes. And so it was more. Uh, yeah, might be um, people expected more about that, but it was more a technical experiment we did uh, for both institution. It was uh, important to to know and make make the yeah, the experiments with this new basic technology as we see it. All right, that's interesting. Um, and is, is there are there any plans to to take this from an from an experimental to a practical level using a DL, DLT technology as a settlement layer anytime soon? Not in the near future. That is uh, because we did uh, yes we we made some tests on this. Uh, on this pilot uh, to see how the scalability is and such things uh, where where are chances to um, to accelerate the performance of the whole thing but this was in this uh, let's say test tube and uh, and whether there will be a day when uh, settlement systems can be uh, improved via blockchain technology might come the day but at the moment we don't see it there's a new uh, system we have this uh, target two security system and in this uh, this is uh, now 
it, it is planned at the moment without uh, any uh, blockchain technology. So if we come to uh, make a new, uh, yes, a renovation of the system might be then, but this will take some years. Speaking of testing, this, this could also be applied to, 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 to the regulatory layer again. What's your take on, on sandbox features, for instance, for blockchain technology, um, something which has um, uh, quite su successfully implemented by the FCA in the UK? What's your take on that one? On the sandbox question? Yeah, general? on sandbox features and in more general from, from both from all perspectives. Yeah, well, definitely. Um, what does the sandbox issue or concept is definitely like intriguing and it's, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, it, it basically is, is based on the fact that blockchain raises a lot of new nascent um, legal issues that even, you know, the prospectus law, you know, has problems addressing. But um, ultimately, uh, that, that's a different question which will be solved on a different level meaning most likely the, you know, uh, European level. So, you know, sandbox also comes with a lot of uh, difficulties and disadvantages because, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, substance over form that, you know. And what, what specific concerns are associated with this, this with sandbox feature? Well, for instance, substance over form, you know, there's, you, you cannot like tailor something specifically to a new phenomenon, right? And you have to use the European framework or the national framework and address those questions. And I'll be more than happy to talk to any like, you know, issuing entity in terms of blockchain or, you know, um, ICOs in general to, to solve those questions and those issues. But the, the UK FCA is, well, at least still bound to the same set of rules, right? Um, and they, they successfully implemented that. Well, is there any a different view from, from a central bank perspective on that one? No, sometimes so you, one you have the impression because the sandbox uh, is, is uh, in everyone's mouth and uh, is so. And, and sometimes uh, the question is, what is uh, what is behind and what is uh, more or less a marketing thing? Because I think also the the Bafin has opened up. I think since 2016, you 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 reorganized yourself, and then there are new entities which are in the dialogue with those fintechs and I think this is the um, yes that is the the core of a sandbox as such and uh, so I think it's not necessary to have exactly those sandboxes but it's uh, of course necessary that all those uh, supervision authorities have to look and to learn and to try to understand uh, from those new uh, ICOs, fintechs etc. Right, and assuming that ICOs are primarily a new f means of funding for very early stage, even pre-product companies, what kind, what kind of, of, of or what level of disclosure would be meaningful from your perspective to dealing with those issues? Because I, we, I think we're, we're all on the same page that we need a certain level of, of investor protection. Um, and it's probably also boils down to the, to the policy question whether or not we would like to see Main Street investing in highly risky early stage startups. It's about disrupting this sort, sort of disrupting the VC uh, industry as well. But what's your perspective from that, from that angle? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think it, it's very interesting how it pushes us back to the old University of Chicago free markets argument about voluntary disclosure. And really, ever since the securities laws were written in the 1930s, there's been pushback saying that mandatory disclosure is both costly, in just in terms of the sheer volume of information, but that it also forces companies to release information that either may not be relevant or may even be harmful to them. And I think you've seen a real flowering of voluntary disclosure under the ICOs. And my research suggests that people simply avoid the ones that don't do any disclosure and that there's really a huge diversity in what companies are choosing to disclose and through which channels, you know, whether it's social media or white papers or even <coughs> regulatory filings. And I have to say that my own views have changed a lot and have really swung in favor of the voluntary disclosure regime. I think that um, the greatest casualty of this is maybe economic research. 
the nice thing you got from mandatory disclosure was a standard set of numbers that you could compare across companies, the same balance sheets, the same prospectus data. And with when disclosure becomes voluntary, you don't get that standardization, so it's much harder to do research. But on the other hand, um, you're seeing such an upsurge in capital formation where people are clearly responding to you know, such an impressive range of ways that people are finding to communicate with them. I think it's just really interesting how these Chicago guys might have been right all along and that we don't need a nanny state saying Main Street shouldn't invest in this. Or, you know, the government thinks this is not suitable. Let people make up their own minds. You know, I think most people um, have enough common sense and the data have been encouraging enough that the, um, the withdrawal of disclosure and the willingness to let companies innovate on their own and decide for their own case, you know, what's best to keep private, what's best to release, um, this may be a better way. I think there's a slightly deviating opinion from the guy right next to you, but we're yeah, well, a regulator is not likely to agree with this. Well, well guilty as charged. I, yeah. I kind of disagree. However, I, I think I have like legitimate reasons to <laughs> slightly disagree on that. However, I agree with you on the following. Voluntary disclosure, you know, kind of like amends mandatory um, yeah, So you see it as a disclosure. floor that people can add to. Well, the more disclosure, the better. The more disclosure, as long as it's accurate, the better. However, um, and yeah, I, I really do think that there shouldn't be like a nanny state. And I really do think that people are entitled to their own decisions, even to their like wrong, you know, wrong decisions and then failures that that's not the government's uh, decision and not the government's job to prevent like every potential outcome or a failure. However, there, there's um, things like the Jesus coin or the Ponzi scheme coin, the Ponzi coin where people like even invested in clearly like, you know, uh, frauds or clear, like, you know, obvious examples of people not being serious about that. Well, so people it's, make it's money off Ponzi schemes as long as you're in early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, and that's my job to prevent that, so that, that's the thing about <laughs> to, to answer your question, um, it really depends. If, if a, an ICO is deemed to issue securities, well, a full-blown prospectus might be in order, but there's also other options. You know, you can you can do private placements or other other stuff. So it really depends on the volume. Y sure, sure. But but isn't isn't it really hard to to try to press a nascent economic phenomenon like a de like decentralized ecosystem based on more or less complex incentive schemes in a pre-product stage to press those 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 phenomenons? In, a, um, in existing securities or prospectus laws, requiring um, to trying to, to, to disclose information those companies doesn't have by nature at this very early stage? Yeah, well, the thing is, we're not pushing anything. We're not pressing them into like that, like, you know, regulatory coffin or anything. If they're a security, then, well, they have to adhere to the securities, you know, law and, and laws that, that pertain to that. Uh, we were totally on the same page. This was more a question from a policy perspective. What should what should a, a, a meaningful disclosure regime should look like? And I, I can I can definitely see that, and I'm likely to agree with you, with you on that. Um, depending on the experiences that we're about to make, there might be the need to have a specialized building block for ICOs for this like you know, new technology. Yeah. Depending on, sorry, depending on the secure on, on, on the experiences, obviously, right? So, I, and I also would like no. to, to <laughs> speak a little bit as a um, as a from a consumer perspective view. And when I see uh, this this total liberal uh, point of view to say yes, um, should uh, the, every every investor knows and every consumer knows, but I'm sure that in especially because this uh, technical progress is so fast at the moment and uh, there are so m very few people who really understand what this kind of ICOs are. So a little bit of standardization would uh, be quite helpful from my point of view. Would you like to directly respond to that? I, 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 I see you just waiting. The <laughs> counter argument is very simple, that if the public doesn't know, the government knows even less. 
and, you know, the, and you know, at least in my country, this is obviously true. I know that the civil service in other countries is somewhat better qualified, and, you know, less politically corrupt. I mean, you look at what's happened in China, where China has banned the ICO, and from everything I read in the press, it's only made the thing more popular, and it's, it's led to even more use of the instrument with the idea that if the government bans it, it must be good. And, um, yeah. You know, where does Germany fall in the whole spectrum of countries and how they've dealt with it? I don't have enough local knowledge to comment on this. But I think you know, there's a general skepticism that the government should be giving financial advice to people in any country because most governments do such a bad job of managing public finance. And you know, China would probably be exhibit A for this, but you know, the US would be on the list and most other countries would too. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, another interesting aspect, speaking again, again of new intermediaries in the space, um, what do you think the, well, we've seen the, the extremely exp impressive numbers of the, the EOS uh, token ICO or um, the Telegram ICO, raising billions of dollars actually. Um, what, just trying to, to, to thinking fast forward 12 or 24 months, what kind of impact that might have on existing financial intermediaries in the conventional or traditional capital markets? I don't think they will exist, really. You know, the banks and stock exchanges are not going to disappear, but they're going to shrink. And I think you're going to see a lot of defensive mergers to the point that, you know, many of these things have a much smaller presence in the economy and are really catering to a legacy market that doesn't wish to deal with these new channels of raising capital. I was asked to speak at a Credit Suisse event, and the CEO took me aside and said how interesting it all was. And I said, you know you're gonna have to merge with UBS. He said, oh no, no, not, you know, not in a million years. But there's all kinds of reputable research reports by people like McKinsey who say that there's just gonna be a lot less banks because the banks are gonna have their business hived off. So you look at what's happening in international payments and how the SWIFT network is quickly being displaced by Ripple and by many other blockchain ventures by the credit card companies and so forth. This is very profitable for the banks, and once that business is gone, the DLT people will look at the next thing where the banks, and pretty soon the banks, you know, one product line at a time are going to lose their profitable businesses to this new technology. They'll be left with the dregs, they'll merge to compete on scale and so forth, but they'll be smaller. I think um, you look at these stock exchange clearinghouses, what's happening with the DTCC in the US, which is embracing the blockchain now after some reluctance. Um, the markets will look very different, and I think employment will be greatly reduced. There's going to be far fewer jobs done by people, many more done by subcon or smart contracts and um, you know, various forms of artificial intelligence. I think the jobs that exist in the finance industry in 10 or 20 years will be much higher value added, and there's a real risk of mass middle class unemployment and things like the audit industry. But um, it's, it's something that you can't turn back the clock on. You can't put this back in the bottle. And I think the cost advantages and the integrity of the data is so overwhelming in favor of the new technology that you're going to see these changes whether you want to see them or not. And it can't really be stopped by governments. Yeah, and it's interesting to see that um, even conventional stock exchanges like the SIGs in Switzerland, the Shanghai Stock Exchange, uh, some exchanges in the yeah, US. Sydney, Australia. Yes, and it started, already started to make up their minds what kind of role they could play in, the, in this future yeah. financial and trying system. trying to stay relevant. You know, right. They, exactly. they understand that this is an existential threat. And um, it's not clear that you even need the stock exchange in the future. But right. if you do, it's probably going to be a blockchain stock exchange. Totally on the same page. Um, and from a regulator's perspective, supervising German banks and financial intermediaries, do you already or do you also see um, this, this way of fast forward thinking in the German banking or financial intermediary industry? Or what's your, your feeling about that? Well, then you would have to talk to a different guy or you know, person at, at, at um, Buffin, but I personally do think that you know, blockchain is, is going to change the market and the industry tremendously. 
And yeah, changes are coming, and that, that's exactly the quote unquote beauty of blockchain, if you like it or not, to completely kill the middleman. Yeah, so changes are coming. Might be I can add something from uh, from the payment sphere because we um, because there is uh, the threat already there. There are competitors from um, from non bank competitors. Uh, if you say okay in a in a legal way, PayPal is a bank, but uh, on the other hand, uh, it's we can group them under this non bank uh, label still. Uh, and, and they are uh, those who are quite, uh, quite successful in the German market when you look on uh, payments in e-commerce. And that was something banks in Germany um, ignored for, I think, uh, quite a, yeah, years uh, since the, yeah, it started, uh, the, the e-commerce started to get remarkable. Uh, in, in the midst of the uh, zero years and then, uh, and then the payment uh, was a more interesting business field, but uh, that was not taken up by, by German banks. And now they have understood and they try to, to uh, correct that development, which is very, very uh, difficult. They have uh, new offerings, but uh, they are not accepted because that's the way the uh, payment market works. That um, if it's, yeah, if, if there is already the demand is satisfied, uh, say the e-commerce, uh, the acceptance of the payments are satisfied with uh, the e-commerce traders and on the other hand uh, people, the payers are also satisfied so it's very difficult to come into that market and I think they have learned from that experience and now they, uh, from my point of view, they, they behave more flexible to invent new uh, offerings like instant payments which is something which uh, can be competitive uh, in nearly every sphere. So uh, there is a learning process, but nevertheless, it's uh, obvious that uh, things are quite hard times, uh, or that, uh, that there are, these are hard times for, for the uh, traditional intermediaries. There was a really good paper upstairs about an hour and a half ago that was comparing mobile payments in China and Germany, and one of the authors, in fact, is from the Bundesbank. And you know, it's clear that the banks, <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the the Alipay and Tencent presence in the Chinese consumer market is so different than what you see in Germany. Now, do you think Germany is going to be stuck in the past forever? Um, Another interesting country is Sweden, where the banks, on a somewhat urgent basis, got together and created this product called Swish, which was meant to preempt the social media companies and the tech companies, and I think has been rather successful at transitioning to a cashless economy in a way that was um, protective of the bank's continued existence, because they realized if they didn't do this, they would you know, be driven to the sidelines, as has already happened in China. I just know that back in the U.S., I don't read about the German banking system that much, but every six weeks there's an article about how troubled Deutsche Bank is and how there's going to be another management team brought in. And if they go down, I think the whole system goes down. And how the government's going to protect them, God only knows, but it's clear that they're 30 years behind and that you know, this is a big problem for the nation. Those guys have far more serious issues than blockchain. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> but um, you already touched um, the the topic of tokenization as a as a means of dig digital securitization. From your perspective, what are the most significant advantages um, a blockchain or DLT based securitization and tokenization has um, opposed to conventional traditional asset backed securities? Yeah. You have to remember that the blockchain is a record keeping technology and it forces people to tell the truth, you know, which is very different than double entry bookkeeping where you rely on an auditor to catch mistakes. And we have seen disasters in the securitization markets in the US and I would just point to 2009 as the greatest example of these. But the, um, the securitization markets have not been transparent and they've been complex to the point that people couldn't understand them. And so the hope is that with blockchain systems that you are able to track this stuff and not able to go back and edit and rewrite data. And, you know, you have to mark things to market in real time and so forth. All the things that didn't happen that contributed to the financial crisis. So you could go watch the movie The Big Short 
and say, you know, what if these CDSs were on blockchains and all these mortgages were connected and then, pro you know, would this have ever gotten to the point that it did 10 years ago? And one hopes that the answer would, would be no. So I think that's the potential, it's just way more robust record keeping that doesn't rely on corrupt third parties like ratings agencies and auditors to keep people honest. Because quickly, it's obvious that they've failed in this, not just in 2009, but for centuries. And this is a better system that relies on artificial intelligence and technology to displace people who have horrible conflicts of interest and have compromised the integrity of the system many, many times. Have you discussed this internally at your agencies back home, how to, how to deal with this kind of new digital securization if it comes well, if we see this really at scale? Well, the thing is you don't need no uh, future legal framework or whatsoever to, to address that question because from a security standpoint, meaning is it a security or not, there, there is even in, in the current law, uh, there is no requirement that, it, that you need some kind of you know uh, certificate or something. So you could like integrate the, the blockchain and the digitalization on there pretty seamlessly, I guess. Yes, not not uh, especially securities, but uh, when I, when I uh, listen to you and do you describe uh, the uh, great advantages you see from those technical uh, equipment uh, in in. Um, Comparison to the to the way uh, this is run by by uh, human beings. So I'm sometimes an, I'm I'm not that optimistic to technique. Um, so I would uh, think we should make sure that within this new ecosystem, in in this blockchain and artificial intelligence uh, sur surroundings, there should be um, and there should be people from the from the from the government from the state to to organize that in a way that there is a that there are proper governance structures uh, whom you can really trust uh, so this is uh, why i think this is a learning from the history of central banks because the things were organized more and more the way uh, that uh, there is a stability of of money and this is something i would also wish to have that uh, for for the Yes, for, this, for the future as well. Yeah, I would see this role better played by market competition than by government ministries. But That's no, no surprise to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when you, when you think, uh, have there been, uh, because when the, the organization, how to make a, a currency stable, um, or to have a, yeah, a stable currency, uh, then it was something uh, that the history learned. There should be something like an organization which should be independent from the governing, from the government, uh, like uh, central banks are, and uh, they have a quite, uh, let's say, narrow mandate just to make sure that the currency uh, will be kept stable. And I think, uh, in general, uh, that works. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can uh, convince me to say that uh, the, the competition in these things uh, would be really better. Depends, well, well just that mm. now I, I would like to add just a, just a few okay. remarks. The thing is, I think uh, we shouldn't limit our, our view to, to jurisdictions like, like Germany or the European Union, even in the US. There are so many, many countries and jurisdictions out there where Bitcoin and other, other cryptocurrencies yes. are considered as, as a super stable means of payment and, and a store of value, as opposed to the, the central bank controlled currencies like, for instance, the, the Indonesia rupiah or so, where, where Bitcoin has been um, so, so popular due to the, the high volatility of the, the, the fiat money back there. Um, so I think this, is, this, is, this heavily depends on the, on the, the ecosystem we're, we're talking about. No, I, I don't think it's ecosystem that much. It's uh, more uh, the regulation, how the central ban bank can act independently from the government. I think this is a sure. crucial factor, and that I would, I have never made empirical uh, research on that how things are in, in Indonesia or, but I'm quite sure that in Venezuela that is not uh, there is not uh, an independent uh, central bank with this mandate as we have that here. For the for the ECB and uh, also for the, the central banks within the euro system. Yeah, 
you know, this is you know, a somewhat different area, and it's, it can be somewhat hard to defend the European Central Bank in light of the Greek debt crisis. And, you know, we don't really need to get into all this. But the phrase, independent from the government, is, I think, important here. And I'm not really suggesting anything too different. I think free markets are independent of the government as well. And where the problems come in is where you have um, you know, securities agencies that are trying to implement policy for political reasons. Um, in the U.S., it seems to have degenerated into turf wars, where you've got the, as of yesterday, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has, you know, they've joined the fray, but you've got the commodities regulator and the securities regulator, all of them trying to grow their budgets and to increase the visibility of the leaders of the agencies in a way that the Federal Reserve perhaps doesn't do. So I think independent central banks are fine. Whether you have one in Europe is an interesting discussion, but I think generally the people regulating the securities markets are not so politically independent. In fact, you know, quite the opposite in my country. Do you would like to add something or? Well, it depends. You know, you should always like uh, dis distinguish the law from politics, obviously, right? Obviously, there there is like you know parts and the, the fringes where it kind of like you know uh, gets conflated or anything. But um, you, you should never mess too much with politics in terms of of the daily application of the law. That's you know pretty much all I can say to that. It's a fine line. <laughs> 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 yeah. How are we doing on time, actually? I think we should open up the discussion for yeah, questions question from the floor. Yeah.